everyone. Wait a moment for uh, y'all to get on here. Happy October. Pretty crazy. Can you believe it's already October? Hi, Carol. Hi, Wesley. Just tuning in before your shift, I guess. <laughs> yeah, get to work. <laughs> um, hi, Kyle. Hope everyone's doing well. Hi, Gail. Hi, Noma. I'm sort of nervous for today because a lot of you guys have been to Greece. Noma and Gail and Tashina and Chris and maybe some other of you too. And it's such a beloved place in people's minds um, that I'm like, oh, I've never been there and I better do it justice. Also, Eric was very sweet and he's like, I have to use the blender for a second. So the background noise will diminish momentarily. Oh, thank you, Andrew. It was my birthday on Monday. And actually, I was inspired because um, I, was, I had grease on the mind. And uh, so I went out to my parents' house and invited some friends and we cooked a Greek dinner. So I was, you know, sort of thinking about all the Greek dishes and looking online and it made me excited to uh, drink the wines. But we made moussaka, we made saganaki, the, the cheese that you light on fire, which I put way too much brandy on and it was like taking a shot of brandy when you ate the cheese. Um, but we made a cool mezza plate with olives and feta and all that fun stuff and what else? Big feta tomato salad. So hopefully you guys have made some fun Greek snacks for yourselves to enjoy alongside. Um, let's see. Who else has been to Greece out of curiosity? I would love to go. It is top of my travel list. Every time I, I want to go, I, I watch Mamma Mia. Which might not be everyone's go-to. Hi, Tashina. I know you have, you've been over there. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we all know where. Oh, Carol, the Willies have been to Greece. Amazing. Yeah, I, I need to get over there. As soon as the travel restrictions are good to go, I am definitely going to go check it out. Um, but I'm sure even if you haven't been, you can sort of picture where it is on a map. Um, you know, it's sort of between... I can never do it right on the screen so it's not backwards. <laughs> no one says it's just like Mamma Mia. Um, but it's sort of between Italy and Turkey. Um, you know, north bordering on the Mediterranean, but it's also in between the Ionian and the Aegean Seas. I printed out a fun little map that I know is going to be backwards that I'll reference later. But this doesn't really show where it is in the context of, of the rest of Europe. I mean, basically, Italy is this way. Turkey is over here. We have Albania, Macedonia, and Bulgaria. This is the Aegean, right? The Aegean Sea here. The Ionian Sea, which sort of runs into the bottom of Italy's boot, and then the Mediterranean is, is down south. Oh, hi, Taylor. I know you're not drinking wine, but hopefully you can still enjoy. Um, well, cool. I'm trying to think if I should wait a minute or two or just dive in. You know, one of the interesting things that I was thinking about as I was doing research for this is, um, is obviously Greece is sort of who we think of as like the godfathers of wine. Um, but then why don't we see any of the wines around anywhere? And why are there hardly any imported and some of them get not that great of a reputation? And how, how is there this disconnect? Because between a, a, a country that sort of started wine and also um, now we don't see any of it. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, and they've just sort of had a, a rough time of it the last couple hundred years, even though it's on top of, you know, basically 4,000 years of winemaking. Um, so I guess we'll just go ahead and dive right in. If you're just joining, welcome. Thank you guys. Hope you're having a great October, start of October. Um, so basically, grapes have been grown on the Greek um, islands and mainland since around 4,000 BC. They've found, uh, hi Michael, um, Mike, they, uh, they have found um, archeological evidence of wild grapes um, in the Neolithic period, around 4,000 BC, um, that weren't quite cultivated yet. But by 2,500 BC, uh, people were cultivating them and there was definitely wine making happening. And they can also tell that through, through archeology. span And you know, the classical age that we think of as like the, the, the height of Greek civilization with all the philosophers and, and all of that really didn't come until, you know, 2000 years later around 500 BC. So for those kind of 2000 years, 
the Greeks were perfecting techniques and learning how to plant and grow. And they actually were experimenting with trellising and pruning and, um, you know, just winemaking in general. You know, that 2,000 years is, is a very long time. So they already sort of knew what they were doing by the time we got to 500 BC where people started, you know, writing about it and, and really embracing it in the culture. Um, you know, if we think about the Odyssey, the Odyssey was written in the 8th century, so somewhere in the 700s BC. Um, and obviously wine is talked about a lot. I'm pretty rusty on it, but, you know, he uses it to get the Cyclops drunk and escape off the island. Um, and, and so it's, it's clear that wine is a part of everyone's lives, even that far back. And so when we get into the kind of classical era um, of, of Greek civilization, the part that a lot of us learn about in school and, you know, where they were putting forth all of these ideas and just all these modern developments, you know, they really kind of came up with ideas that were very advanced. You know, in, in, in one part, culturally, the wine was starting to get tied to all sorts of celebrations and, and you know, religious um religious occurrences and, and weddings and deaths and kind of ritual in general, um, wine began to, began to be associated with that. Um, and as we know, you know, ever since then, wine has had a cultural tie to religion um, or not, as we'll hear uh, what happened a little later. Um, you know, we've all heard of Dionysus, who's the god of wine. Um, you know, he's the god of wine, drinking in general and uh, wine making as well. Um, so people, you know, wine was one of the only things that someone could make and sell for money, obviously agricultural products and, and wine was sort of one of those or textiles, you know, so it was one of these valuable um, ways that people could make money. And so they would pray and, and make sacrifices to Dionysus in the hopes that he would give them the knowledge to make good wine. Um, so it wasn't just all about getting drunk and partying, but that being said, if you've ever heard of the cult of Dionysus, so cult obviously has sort of a bad connotation nowadays, but you wanted to be in the cult of Dionysus in the Greek era. You know, it just meant that you loved life and you, and drinking wine was a part of that. So they would have these, you know, sort of Dion, I don't know what the Dionysian, Dionysian, um, big celebrations that were crazy parties where you would, you know, roast a bunch of animals and and there would be apparently Dionysus loved tigers and donkeys and goats and so there would always be those animals running around and there would be like dancing competitions and drinking competitions and it was a whole thing and I'm not going to go on up on this tangent for too long but I thought this was kind of cool because I come from a drama background but they would do something at these Dionysus celebrations um, called the goat song where they would sacrifice a goat and they would sing a song that they had written kind of talking about what they wanted Dionysus to hear or help them with, whether it was like an ethical problem or a social problem or a question for the gods. And that is basically the birth of modern drama, like that chorus. And then breaking out of that, one person would talk and it would be a callback and that was how dialogue started. And that goat song is what led into modern drama. So I just thought that was kind of cool that actually wine gave birth to drama. So anyway, back to wine. On a technical level, they also had a lot of ideas and contributions um, that we think of as very modern. For instance, um, associating wine with a specific place, you know, terroir, this whole concept of like a wine tastes different coming from this vineyard or this climate than it does from that one. So they started to uh, look at not even just the name of the um, the, the region, um, but like the subregion and the vineyard. And, you know, obviously the monks really got nitty gritty with that in, in Burgundy and elsewhere, but they at least started to recognize that that was an idea and, and were labeling their wines as such. Um, and also, you know, the, the sommelier, the concept of a sommelier is, is definitely rooted to French history, but wine was for the first time a profession in the Greek era. Um, and I, apparently there were people in Greek society that their job was to like know about wine and I couldn't find a name for what those were, but that's kind of cool as well. And even responsible consumption, you know, the Greeks had, you know, the philosophers were famous for having these very ethical 
debates and dilemmas that they were trying to work through and people even recognize sort of the pluses and the, the, the negatives of alcohol consumption and they were even starting to think about stuff like that. Um, okay, so let's move on from sort of the height of the Greek era and when the Greek era, when the Greek civilization started to decline, obviously the Romans took over. But luckily, the Romans loved everything Greek and especially the wine part of it. And so they adopted, um, you know, pretty much all of Greeks, uh, Greece's uh, techniques and started spreading them uh, all across Europe. And, you know, I should have said Greece was obviously at its height trading as well. So there's there's shards of <laughs> the Greek word for sommelier is Kelsey. <laughs> very kind of you. I don't think I could pronounce it if it was in Greek. Um, but there's, there's shards of, of Greek amphora, um, meaning there was wine in those amphora, you know, all across the Mediterranean. And then when the Romans took over, it started to spread even further, northern Europe and then eventually east. Um, and so what Greece sort of turned into was, was part of the Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire. So if you're just as a brush up on your European history verbiage, the Byzantine Empire was basically the Eastern Roman Empire, and that included, and the capital of that was Constantinople, which Emperor Constantine was a Roman Empire. So even though the Western Roman Empire started to fall apart around the 5th century AD, we're now in AD, um, the Byzantine Empire lasted for another thousand years, taking us all the way up to like the 1400s. And so all of this time was still part of this kind of golden, long golden era of, of Greek wine. You know, during this time, techniques are still being advanced, um, grapes are, you know, being differentiated, all, all of this good stuff is happening. And then we hit 1453, and that is when the Byzantines got conquered by the Ottoman Turks. And if you remember to what we talked about in Serbia and also in Jerez and Sherry, um, the Ottomans, uh, being a Muslim um, empire, do not like alcohol. Um, alcohol is is forbidden to the Muslims to the Muslim faith, and so um, therefore cultivation and production and even wine growing um, and, and definitely drinking is technically forbidden because the Ottoman Empire was very large, there's gonna be differentiation uh, region by region, depending on how strict people are and how much extra cash whoever's in charge wants to make. So in some areas of Greece, literally nothing was allowed. They destroyed the vineyards, couldn't drink anything, couldn't make anything, nothing. In other parts, they said, okay, well, you know, since you're technically, um, you know, uh, Greek Orthodox, you know, we'll allow you to drink little parts, little bits of wine on a very like small basis. You know, you can grow it and make it just for your family, but we're gonna tax you at an extremely high rate. And then if they couldn't afford to pay the taxes, then they would destroy the vineyards. And usually they would take a little of the wine for themselves along with the taxes. So it just depended how shady the, the rulers were. But point is they were under Ottoman rule for 400 years. And that really put a wrench. In, that was sort of the beginning of the end, or the beginning up till now of a really rough time for Greek wine. And, and we start to see why we don't see any Greek wine around. Um, and I should have mentioned during the sort of 1500 years in the Byzantine Empire, because the Byzantines were Greek Orthodox, the Romans introduced Christianity, Ding, 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 Christianity plus wine equals happy monks. And um, we know that the monks really play a big role in, in, in doing all things wine related, cultivation, production, you know, analysis, um, just kind of pushing everything forward. So, so they had made a lot of strides and the monasteries owned a lot of lands. So when it came to the, the rule of the Ottoman Turks, the only people by the end of those 400 years that still retained vineyards and even the knowledge to make the wine basically were the, the monasteries and the monks in those monasteries. So thankfully they held on to, to some of that. So it wasn't a complete restart, um, but still it was a very, very rough transition. And you know, we talked about like in, in Sherry, Spain is further from like the heart of the Ottoman Empire. So they could like get around things a little better and, and fight it off a little bit more. But Greece is right there and they were pretty locked in. 
Um, so they couldn't, they were, they were there for a very long time, longer, longer than Spain was under the Ottoman rule. So finally we get to 1821, I think, 1821, Greek War of Independence, which is great, but it's a 10 year bloody war. It leaves the Greeks um, independent, which is fantastic, but also completely broke, war torn, you know, vineyards have been destroyed, people have been killed, etc., etc. And so they have hardly any money to try and rebuild anything, much less their wine culture. And then Phylloxera hits. Um, and an interesting thing is that, you know, if we look at this map, this is sort of mainland Greece. And so Phylloxera really got its claws into mainland Greece, but actually a lot of the islands um, never got hit by it. In one part, just because of the isolation, you know, because of the water separating. But in another part, because they're all volcanic islands. And we'll talk about geography in a second, but the fact that their soils were huge, uh, God, I think I heard the stat, it was like 40 meters, I mean, that sounds crazy, but maybe it is, 40 meters thick of pure volcanic soils, the phylloxera bug couldn't live in there. Um, so most of Greece got hit by phylloxera, but not all of it. And then just as they're bouncing back from Phylloxera, we know this story from a lot of the rest of Europe, World War I hits, then no one's recovered from that, then World War II hits. And so the period of the 1960s to 1990s, as we've heard from many of these European countries, was a low point in quality wine production um, because everyone is financially distressed and, um, and also there's, there's sort of this, there seems to be this confusion around oh, we're in a modern age, like we need to plant these like, not modern varietals, but there was a major transition to ripping out indigenous varietals and planting um, kind of the, the, the traditional inter, not traditional, the international varietals, which are basically French varietals, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Chardonnay, because those were such big players on the stage. So in those 30 years, so many countries lost a lot of this uh, you know, sort of authenticity and, and local character because everyone was ripping out the local stuff and, and planting these more familiar names. And so Greece did the same thing, um, but also they, they lacked the funds to sort of get the technology where they needed it to be. So they had a lot of issues with, with flaws in wine. Oxidation is a major issue in Greece in part because of the heat and the humidity. Um, volatile acidity they were struggling with, just sort of general hygiene in a lot of the modern wineries. Um, this is his comment. The Greeks resisted Hitler, so his armies occupied and starved them. Oh, there you go. Well, they just had a great time then. Um, yeah, so just just one more sort of drop in the bucket of, of why the last century for them, or well, I guess the last five, six centuries now have been a really hard time. Um, that's awful. So, so also during this time period, like we, I feel like a broken record in how a lot of European countries sort of came out with a product that they thought would like make it big for them because they were in this new modern world. You know, we talked about Blue Nun, sort of the equivalent of White Zen with Germany. Last week we talked about Beaujolais Nouveau, which maybe sort of had a, it definitely had an audience, but it sort of tarnished the reputation on the world stage of the country overall. And for Greek, it was a little thing called Retsina. Has anyone had Retsina? I've only had it once. And it was a good version of it, but I still was not crazy about it. And, and I feel like that's one of the nicer things I've heard said about Retsina. Um, basically, Retsina, unlike how Blue Nun and Beaujolais Nouveau were trying to sort of please a more American palate that liked something sweet, <laughs> Good. The, the people who have been to Greece are not fans of it. Great. Um, so I just lost my train of thought. So this was rather than being based on like, oh, let's make a sweet thing to sell to Americans. This was based on an actual tradition in Greek winemaking, um, which is that it is wine made with pine resin or pine sap. And the reason for it is that way back in the day, way back in the classical era, when they were making wine and storing it and transporting it in amphora, they couldn't get a tight seal because it's just hard clay on hard clay. And so what they started doing was lining the uh, amphora seals with uh, pine tar, pine resin, so that it would be airtight. 
um, for transportation. And in some cases, I think they would actually line the entire amphora with this pine tar to make it more airtight and prevent oxidation. And so basically, um, Gail lived there in her 20s and has had much retsina. Um, and now, what I can't understand is I thought retsina was just um, this, it's a white wine, and so I thought it was just made in a vessel that had retsina in it. But now I guess they actually add the pine sap, or not, had pine sap in it. Um, now they actually add the pine sap during fermentation. So it's like mixed in with the must of the grapes, and then they press it out, uh, or filter it out, pardon me. Um, so it's not in the wine when you drink it. But point is, it tastes like pine sap. It tastes like pine salt and it's not that great. So people, that sort of started getting exported a lot out of Greece and people thought it was terrible and that sort of further tarnished the reputation. And then they sort of finally started getting their feet under them in like the late 90s, early 2000s and growers started re-embracing um, native varietals again and sort of trying to find a lot of the indigenous varietals that had been lost. And then if you remember back to 2010, their entire economy collapsed. So. They've had a rough last couple hundred years. Um, and they just now, um, it, it's starting to be, quality Greek wines are starting to make an appearance more on the American stage. Maybe, this is a, an interesting fact, 40% of, of Greek wine exported goes to Germany. I don't know what, exactly why that is, um, but Greeks drink more German wines than anyone else in the world. And Gail says on Retsina, today most, mostly only very old Greeks still drink it. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard Retsina, people say it's technically more like a vermouth um, because a vermouth is an aromatized wine where you actually add herbs to it to give it a flavor, um, except that vermouth is usually fortified or is fortified and this is not. Um, so anyway, it, it's just been very recently that like wineries have on a larger scale. I'm, I'm sure that there's, you know, for those of you who've been there, maybe you can correct me. I'm sure that there's a lot of small scale wineries or family owned, just little production. They're making amazing wine and are probably using indigenous varietals and, and have, are doing a great job, but those aren't necessarily on a larger scale. Um, and so, oh great, Greg actually has seen a Mafro. Amazing, that's what we're gonna drink, perfect. Um, point is, it's very recent. So, you know, it's hard to know like what exactly to <laughs> to cover in a in a lesson on a country that is so varied and has such a long history. So, I just sort of wanted to give you a brief historical snapshot. And both of the wines. Well, I guess let's talk a little bit about geography right now, because as you could probably guess from looking at this map. Um, there's a lot of microclimates. It's a country that is very spread out and has a lot of varied terrain. Um, you know, up here, this is very mountainous. This whole mainland area, we're coming down from the Balkan Peninsula. This is actually pretty like rugged and cool and mountainous. Um, and then you get further down here and we're obviously sandy beaches, Mediterranean. So the, the wines, and this is, this is my bad. I thought that the white that we were getting today was from um, Santorini, which is sort of its natural birthplace, which is an island. Um, and it's actually from Peloponnesa, the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Oh, I guess this whole thing is Peloponnesian Peninsula. Um, so both of the wines we're gonna be tasting are from the, the mainland. And exactly like Sarah said, my thought was maybe sometime in the near future, we'll do like an island wine day and do Greek islands or maybe even throw in Sardinia or you know an Italian island, even maybe Corsica. Um, since today we're mo mainly going to be focusing on the Greek mainland. So if that sounds fun, let me know um, because we're just not gonna be able to do every area justice. So in terms of the climate on the mainland, let's just focus on that. A lot of variation even within that, but we're on the 39th parallel in terms of latitude. So we sort of think of like the 45th parallel as, as the ideal like Pinot Noir, Chardonnay growing region, kind of cooler climate. So obviously we're a lot closer to the equator than that. And that means that it is a hot, hot region. So even though this region, this area is sort of the birthplace of wine, it is a very challenging place to grow quality wine. 
So if you're in a very hot and in places humid climate, what are some things that you could think of that you could look for vineyard sites for, um, you know, where would you look to plant grapes if you were in a climate that hot? Um, I mean, the, the big one is that you would go up. You can't really change where you are geographically, um, but you can change where you are in terms of altitude. And luckily for Greece, or probably why grapes have done so well there in spite of the heat, is it is very mountainous. Um, even the islands are very mountainous. And so most of the best wine comes from really high slopes. Greg says, a little great student over here. Elevation, slope, coast proximity. You are just answering all the right things. Yes, absolutely. And it's sort of the opposite. So in a lot of cooler regions, if you're higher up, I mean, if you're closer to the 45th parallel, you're gonna look to plant on southern slopes because you're gonna get the most sun exposure. In Greece, they're doing the opposite. They're planting on the northern slopes so they get the least intense sun um, so that they don't burn the grapes or over ripen them. Oh, so Gail, thank you for correcting me. It's not humid, it's arid. Good to know. Um, great, then that is less of a concern. That makes sense then why, I, why you hardly hear about like rot being as much of an issue there. So, um, yes, yeah, so you, you want to plant high up. Um, and so it's easier to do that. Well, they're not easier, but it's where most of the best wine regions are on the continent are in these very mountainous regions. So um, what was the other thing I was going to mention on geography before we jump into... Oh, I guess just that, you know, you're going to... There's a lot of fertile land in Greece as well. And so you really want to look for infertile uh, soils to, put, to grow grapes in. That's what we've talked about before. You know, grapes thrive in really rocky, um, chalky, limestone, even sand. But they don't want really fertile soils um, because it's not going to cause them to thrive and it's not going to make the roots go deep and the grapes aren't going to end up having as much complexity. So you're going to look for high up and non-fertile soils. So let's because I've already talked for 30 minutes and I wanna make sure we can taste wine. Let's talk about the white wine. So these are the two wines that we're gonna to taste today. The white is called Assyrtico, the grape is called Assyrtico, and the red is called Zeno Mavro, Zeno Mavro. And Assyrtico's natural home is Santorini. So like I mentioned, I was hoping that this was from Santorini. I think this producer makes one from Santorini something like that i got confused um but santorini is is way down here and again i don't want to get too much into island geography but if you if you were drinking one from from santorini obviously it would be grown on fully volcanic soils um and so that would give the wines a certain amount of minerality the grape itself has very uh high acidity naturally um, and so it can stand up to this hot climate and retain its acidity no matter what. Um, and these, the soils that this one is grown in, so this one is from, instead of being from Santorini, it's from this edge of the Peloponnesia, of Peloponnesa. And so it's, the vineyard is about 1,500 feet, yep. So pretty high elevation and um, kind of like clay, limestone, rocky soils. So just like we talked about, high up, rocky, um, this is an organic producer. Um, they're doing everything by hand, native fermentation, sort of all of that good stuff. And I'm interested to see what you guys think about it. Let's put it in our glass. Traditionally, a Sirtico, especially the ones that come from Santorini, they're thought to be wines that can stand up to heavier food. So obviously it's not a red wine, but you could sort of treat it like you do a red wine in terms of pairing. It has a heavier body. It has sort of a weightier, maybe oilier texture, but it has this really like searing acidity. So you could sort of think about it in structure um, in terms of maybe a Chenin Blanc or a Riesling, um, even though it doesn't really taste like those grapes. So let's, just do the tasting and tell me what you guys are noticing. So in terms of the color, is there pros at this now, but it's pretty light in color, sort of a, a pale, pale straw, like star bright. I would say less notes of orange and more notes of like green, very subtle green. And so 
based on what you guys know, that already tells us a couple things right off the bat um, because we don't see any orangey or tawny notes in it. What does that mean? It means that it doesn't have probably two things being age, um, which can give it some color, uh, or I guess three things. It wouldn't have age, it wouldn't have oxidation, so exposure to oxygen, which would make it darker, um, and it wouldn't have probably skin or uh, barrel contact. Yeah, exactly. So skin contact is gonna make it orangey, and then time in a wooden barrel. Sometimes it doesn't really make it orange, but sometimes it deepens that kind of yellow color. Um, and this doesn't have any of those, so we can probably safely assume it was fermented in a non-oak container. Um, and I wrote it down, I believe, I believe it's stainless steel. Even though there's a, a jug on the front, um, this actually isn't an amphora wine. This, the, this little jug is not an amphora. It's what they would um, use like at the homes just for their own personal indoor wine. So you'd pour the wine, you'd make the wine in your backyard, you'd put it in here, I think, and then this is what you'd serve it out of. Um, tell me what you guys are getting on the nose of this wine. It smells very pretty to me. So it's, in terms of being aromatic, I would say it's, it's fairly aromatic. It's not as aromatic as maybe a Riesling or a Gewürztraminer, but definitely more aromatic than say a Chardonnay or one of these more neutral varietals. But what are some notes you guys are getting? I think it's a very pretty, fresh smelling white. Um, maybe any floral notes in there or any citrus notes, any other type of fruits that you're picking up. I hate that there's a delay on here. Here we go. Um, lemon butter, that's a great, that's a, that's a really great uh, note on the nose. Tropical fruit, yeah, just a little bit, absolutely. I mean, I don't get like super ripe tropical fruit, but yeah, maybe a little bit of like lychee, um, like a hint of pineapple. Does anyone get sort of like a, a jasmine or like gardenia, kind of like a pretty white flower. I sort of pick that up. Any kind of sit, well, Tashina said lemon butter. Yeah, I, I, I feel like there's a lot of citrus in here, lemon lime, white peach and lychee, those are great notes. Maybe even a little bit of like green apple, some kind of like tart, crisp apple. Let's taste it and see what we think. Probably pineapple, yep. Tell me what you guys are noticing in terms of the body, the acidity. Shouldn't be any tannin in there. Um, anything we're tasting on the palate that we weren't tasting, or that we weren't smelling on the nose. Sort of the trademark of this grape is the acidity. I'm sure you guys are picking that up. There's a lot of acidity in there. And you know, that's an interesting thing is that these, because they've been growing these grapes for thousands of years. And actually, um, Asirtiko is possibly the longest continuously cultivated varietal in the world. Um, meaning that, you know, there even, the, so this was something I sort of left out of the, the historical part because we didn't talk a lot about the islands, but Santorini being an island kind of got protected a little bit from the Ottoman Turks by the Venetians actually. So the Venetians for about 500 years from the 12th to the 17th century were trading a ton in the Greek islands and actually sort of took those islands under their control when the Ottomans had the rest of Greece. So wine continued to be made there. And with Phylloxera, there wasn't a break then because it didn't affect those vineyards, which means Assyrtiko has been growing and adapting for, you know, 4,000 years. Um, so you guys are saying minerality, light body, light body, high acid, mineral taste. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I again, I'm sorry that this isn't from Santorini and isn't from volcanic soils, but I'm glad that it's still representing the, the minerality of that this grape is sort of capable of expressing. Crisp, very nice with feta. That was gonna be my next question is what you guys would pair it with. Um, is So Andrew says, is the acid the mouthwatering quality? Yes, so the way I was taught 
and always think about detecting acidity is how much your mouth waters after you drink it. Um, so, I mean, it almost makes your mouth pucker. Like this has a lot of acidity to it and your mouth will keep salivating for a long period of time. So exactly, that's how you detect acidity. Tannin is how, how much it dries your mouth out. So like the lick your teeth off, that's how you tell tannin, which we'll find out in the red wine coming up. Um, but acidity is generally how much you salivate. And let's see, what other, you know, I was gonna mention uh, one grape that this gets compared to a fair amount, especially when it's grown in Santorini, is Albarino. Um, it has sort of that similar like floral, peachy, apple-y nose to it. Sometimes, especially if it's grown near the ocean, it can have that kind of like saline, salty thing. Um, I would just say it's it has a little more acidity than Albarino. Kalamata olives, feta, octopus. Yes, absolutely. All of those like coastal Greek dishes that you think of, all the seafood, the grilled fish, um, even oysters. Um, yeah, olives, feta, that's that sort of like mezza platter, snacky stuff, um, and seafood would be fantastic with this. Um, you know, we obviously, Greek has, Greece has a lot more of those like big heavier stewed meat dish, dishes, and those would probably go better with what we're, the red we're about to taste up next. What do you guys think about this wine? Is it too acidic? Do you like it? I know, um, you know, maybe I'll, when we do the island one, maybe I'll find another Assyrtico, maybe we'll do a different grape. Um, this is sort of an entry level Assyrtico, so I, I think this is really enjoyable. I think it's a great bottle. I don't think it's the most complex wine in the world. And so, you know, I, I just wanna get across that, and maybe Gail and, and Noma and Tashina can, can tell me, but it's it's reputed, it's very highly reputed and, and apparently can gain a lot of complexity um, you know, wind grown in these really old vineyards, etc. cetera. I'm glad, Andrew, I'm glad you like it. Um, oh, and just a thing, I, I, it's not too acidic if you have a good food match, great. Yeah, and the Greeks play with acidity a lot in their food. You know, the, the, the brine on olives and on feta, feta is a brined cheese. Um, you know, they, the acidity plays off each other well. It's assertive in its acidity, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, get some olives or some feta to pair with it. And if you saw my Instagram post, I think it was yesterday, I wanted to mention, you know, an interesting thing about a lot of Greek vineyards is that they are pruned in and grown in really crazy ways. So especially on islands like Santorini or on, on coasts, um, and even in the mountains, because of the way the mountains are situated, there can be a lot of wind, and wind is not great for grapes because it, you know, it pulls the grapes off, it hurts the vines, it breaks them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in very windy regions, they'll do a couple things. They'll either um, bush train the vines, which is basically they don't they don't tie it to a trellis or along a wire. They just sort of let it grow, and the the vines end up kind of coming out and looking like this. So they have these really old vines that are really thick around, and they have these kind of gnarled branches that can withstand the wind or they'll train the grapevines into like little nests. Um, and that was sort of the picture, I think that's what's in the picture that I posted. You should Google like Santorini vineyards. Um, but they'll actually train the vines in sort of like a little circle, like a little basket or a nest so that they have some nice structure and then the grapes sort of grow within those. Um, and they'll also sometimes put a little like dip in the, uh, in the ground before they do it. So it's sort of a, a wind shelter essentially. So that's kind of fun. Um, yeah, Nova says, if it's a hot day and you're on the Aegean, the acidity can be your friend. Absolutely. So let's talk about, let's jump in and talk about the red wine next. Um, and there's, a, I'll mention at the end, you know, there's, there's a lot of other great Greek varietals. And I think these two are some of the best known in the States. Um, but yeah, we could totally do a, you know, a whole series on Greece and, and I'll try to mix some in in the future. Um, Gail says, in Santa Rufo, the vines look like a holiday wreath and lay on the ground. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I was thinking with these little baskets or nests. They sort of look like a little wreath. And I've never seen vines trained like that anywhere else in the world. It's worth a Google search to check them out. So now we're going to move further up the, uh, the peninsula into more mainland Greece. So we're going to Macedonia. And there's a little subregion, I don't mind my little hand-drawn map here, um, called Nausa. 
don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, sort of right under the word Macedonia. Um, and it's actually bordering on the country of Macedonia. So it's much more mountainous, it's much cooler. I mean, much is a strong term. It's still, it's still where it is on the, on, in terms of latitude. So it's still pretty warm, but compared to Santorini, it's gonna be a lot cooler. And there are these mountains which sort of protect it from the cooler winds in the north. But those mountains also create uh, cool winds to the Aegean. Um, so it definitely gets cooling breezes um, that come in through there um, that help with the heat. And whereas um, the Peloponnese though, that we were talking about was sort of like coastal Mediterranean um, or mountainous Mediterranean in terms of its climate, this is much more continental with Mediterranean influence. So the winters can actually be cooler here um, and sometimes kind of harsh. Um, but the summers are still hot. So that means you can probably, um, I mean, you could, you could grow red or white no matter where, but um, it, red, they've, they've developed red wine a little bit more there. It seems like in the hotter regions in the south, people really only want to drink white because it's so damn hot. Of course, there are some exceptions. So this grape, Zeno Mavro, let's put it in the glass and talk about it. Um, it's from Nausa. And... There might be a grape that comes to mind when we look at it right in the glass itself. Let's see if you guys can sort of see the color and the body here. This paper isn't really doing it justice, but tell me what you're noticing about the body and the color. It's very distinctive looking. And if I was just looking at it, I would probably think of another grape varietal right off the bat. So is it full bodied? Is it light bodied? sort of a ruby color? Does it have purpley notes? Does it have more like tawny or orangey or bricky kind of notes to it? This delay is the worst. Um, I think it looks a lot like Nebbiolo. I'm sure a lot of you guessed that. But it's lighter in body and it has this real kind of like cherry red color but with this kind of bricked out like tawny notes to it. Yeah, such a pretty color, ruby. Um, so it's, it's unusual just right off the bat. And people will compare Zeno Mavro um, to Nebbiolo a lot. You know, a lot of Italians will definitely easily say Nebbiolo is the superior grape and I haven't drank enough Zeno Mavro to make a, a judgment on that. But they have a lot of similarities in terms of their structure. Um, Tashina, you are spot on, absolutely. Light body, pretty ruby. Yeah, ruby was sort of like these tawny undertones or brick undertones. Um, it definitely tastes different than Nebbiolo, um, but we'll see with the light body and you guys tell me about the tannins. That's sort of why people draw the comparison. So let's smell it and tell me what you guys are smelling. There's definitely some fruit there, but there's also a lot of like savory notes in spice. So yes, I think we get like the kind of cherry, cherry fruit, like more of the red fruit in there. Um, smoky, that's a big one, absolutely. And, that, and that's a similar one that we would get with Nebbiolo too. You know, people say Nebbiolo smells like tar and roses. And I don't think this is super floral, but you do get that kind of like smoky tar kind of smell. I also think like there's kind of like an anise or like spicy clove, some kind of uh, spicy edge to it um, and also um, almost like tomato or, or some kind of like savory note. It's unique for sure. <laughs> Alright, let's taste it. Maybe some pepper. Yeah, absolutely. All right, put it in your mouth and tell me what you are noticing about the tannin and the acidity, because both of them are pretty prevalent, especially after we just talked about how to um, detect tannin. Tell me what you guys are, what's happening in your mouth after you drink this wine. <laughs> Looks like very light and innocent. Oh, we didn't even talk about the legs. I skipped the legs today. It's going straight to the juice. 
the alcohol on this one, I think it's like 12.5 on the on the Assyrtico and 12.5 on the red. So that, that shows you that they must be pretty high elevation and, and picking on the earlier side to, to get um, alcohol levels that are, aren't totally blown out. Um, nicely tannic and spicy. Yeah, I think this wine is very tannic. <laughs> Tashina says my mouth is confused. Um, yeah, you would look at this and you'd think it was gonna be you know, low tannin, kind of soft, maybe kind of fruity, but there's definitely some tannin on here. Um, and honestly, I think this wine could do with some aging. I, sh I meant to say this at the beginning, which was like open the bottle now and maybe even decant it if you can, but, but maybe do that after we've <laughs> finished here because um, this wine definitely needs to open up a little bit it has a lot of tannin and being 2017 it's still fairly tight um, Noah says more full-bodied than I would have thought yeah yeah like it looks it looks very light um, but those tannins are just so prevalent and exactly what Andrew said it's still very acidic as well um, you know it's it's not as acidic as the Assyrtico but like your mouth is watering and the tannins are sort of sticking to your teeth. So all of the things are happening in your mouth, exactly, just like Tashina said. Um, this for me is definitely a food wine, just like with Nebbiolo. Um, you know, I love Nebbiolo, but I don't just wanna like sip it on its own. Um, you know, often regions will have grapes that are more finicky, but kind of can end up being more complex. And in Piedmont, for instance, Nebbiolo is that, you know, it's, it's harder to grow, it's harder to do well, um, but you need to pair it with food. And then they have a grape like Barbera, where it's a little more chuggable and easy drinking, and you can just kind of drink it on its own. Um, so this is definitely in that sort of Nebbiolo side of things. Um, and I'm not sure the other red varietals that they grow in Macedonia. I know like Azurtico is a big one, so. Anyway, point is, I would I would pair this with some food. Um, what would you guys think to pair on this red wine? Ooh, got some tannin to it. Oh, good, Noma. I'm glad you glad you liked them because you've drank a lot more Greek wine than I have. You know thinking back to the dinner that I had on Monday. Um, whereas, you know, we talked about the Assyrtico being really good with like seafood, you know, it comes from the coast and anything that comes from the ocean is naturally gonna be a great pairing for that. This being more inland, you can probably be thinking meats. I mean, meats would be the, the obvious choice right off the bat. Um, ooh, I don't even know what that is, souvlaki. I remember looking that up last week, something with beef or lamb. They eat a lot of lamb there. I think grilled lamb, stewed lamb would be great with this. We had moussaka, um, which is usually like beef and eggplant, tomato. Yeah, exactly. You guys are thinking just what I'm thinking. Um, but anything with, you know, stewed tomatoes, peppers, some kind of meat in there. Um, okay, Suvaka is sort of like the, the pie. Is it like a pastry with, with, with lamb and stuff in it? Should have researched this beforehand. Um, and you could even, you know, a dish that has olives or has feta, like you could see how the acidity in here would still be a nice natural pairing for those kind of brinier Greek snacks. You would just make maybe want something with more meat in it to pair with the tannins um, to kind of mellow those out. Stewed beans. Oh, is that what souvlaka is? Oh, is, I can't tell, if, can't tell if you guys are sending out extra pairing ideas. <laughs> Or just saying stewed beans would be good with it too. Yeah, I could see that, absolutely. Lamb on a spit, cool. Um, what are you guys, uh, oh, lamb kebabs. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. That's why I've seen this around. Um, and, and because of the kind of spicy notes in here, I feel like having fresh herbs would be a great pairing as well, like rosemary would be great. Uh, maybe even thyme, sage, stuff like that, those kind of Mediterranean herbs that we think of would probably be really great with, with any of these wines. Um, I hope you guys have some fun dinner ideas or, or plans for tonight or maybe tomorrow. You know, this, the white I'm sure 
there's enough acidity in here that you could wait a, a day to drink this and it'd be fine. The red, I bet you could even wait two days because it has so much tannin and it could really open up a little bit. So don't stress out if you can't drink them tonight. I'm sure it'll still be fine. Um, before we end, I just wanted to list a couple other uh, Greek, var Greek varietals if you liked these and wanted to go seek more out. Um, some other really great ones are, um, I mentioned Ajortico, which actually means St. George's grape. It's A-G-I-O-R-T-I-K-O. -I -I That's also grown on the mainland. Um, and then a lot of other whites. Um, Divina is a really nice white wine. Uh, Mosca Falero or Mosca Falero, I don't know how to say it. Mosca Falero um, is a great white. Often the whites tend to be kind of like floral, aromatic, bright acidity, stuff like that. Um, Roditas, um, which I have never had Roditas, but it is, uh, sorry, I need to turn off the damn, it's like my, my app use timer. It was like, you've used up all your allotted time on Instagram today. Sorry about that. Um, but Roditas is a one worth trying. It makes sort of like a darker colored or uh, white, or sometimes they'll turn it into a rosé. Um, what was the other one? Oh, um, Malvasia is grown a lot there. The, I mentioned the Venetians earlier, but the Greeks, there's actually a port um, on one of the Greek islands that sounds a lot like Malvasia. I can't remember exactly what the name is, but they sort of adopted that and brought it into Italy. Um, and actually in, in various parts of Italy because they were traders and they were sailing around, they really spread Malvasia around the Italian um, peninsula. <laughs> Can we go to a field trip to Greece? I would love that. Oh, if you guys want to go on a, a trip, I could plan it with some help and we could all go over there. That would be fun. Set up some stuff at wineries and restaurants. Um, oh, and Robola, um, which is the, the sister grape of the Italian uh, Robola Gialla, um, but they call it Robola. And I've had like a skin contact uh, version one of those. Yes, perfect. Um, and so that's a fun one too. And I know that honestly, these Greek wines are, are hard to find. And so it's, I wanted to find some good examples, but there are good examples out there. You just have to look for them. So you guys are all excited about this trip now. I know, I wanna get out of town. Let's charter a boat. Let's go on a private plane, you know? Let's just do it now and like have our own little COVID bubble and all get a private plane. We can go to our own island. We can have a winemaker come, it'll be great. It'll be great. <laughs> Perfect. I'll get planning. It'll give us all something to look forward to. Perfect. Um, but yeah, if you guys enjoyed this, you know, I, I think it would be fun to do an island wine tasting. So maybe I'll plan that for November or December when we're all looking at the gray winter, unable to leave our houses and to void off the depression. We'll take a, a, a trip to the islands of the Mediterranean and maybe throw like Sardinia or something in too. Um, Cool, I realize I finished kind of early today. I had a lot to cover and I was trying to like rush through. Any questions on Greece or on the rest of the month or any ideas for stuff for the future? <laughs> Andrew says, by the way, everyone, the pork chop at Arden is incredible. Well, shout out. Ooh, kitchen's very excited. Um, yeah, if you haven't been in in the last week or two, we like completely changed out the menu for fall. And so it's like all new stuff. Even the burrata is changing today. The tomatoes and, and stone fruit is gone and roasted squash and brown butter is in. Even though it's sort of summery outside that the produce is sort of changing over and probably be getting back into the, the rainy stuff soon. Um, Oh, Noma says the albacore crudo is great too. You guys are awesome. Woo! <laughs> uh, oh yeah, that's a good idea, Sarah. Verticals could be fun with half bottles. Yeah, I, I've been trying to find some, some way to play with age in a smart way. So that's definitely in the books coming up. Um, next week, we're gonna talk about Chenin Blanc, which this, this is gonna be the first, next week is gonna be the first week where we actually just focus on a specific varietal. I know we did, um, Syrah a long time ago where we talked about new world old world We talked less about the varietal itself um, And so next week we'll really be looking at like where did Chenin Blanc come from? What are its characteristics? Where does it do well? How does it change depending on where it's grown? I think it's one of the most interesting white varietals, which is why I picked it and we haven't tasted it yet But we are tasting one from New Zealand and one from the Loire Valley 
and there's going to be some differences so we'll touch on the geographical and, and historical differences on those regions as well so let me know how you guys like that um what else i think that's all the things i have to tell you you get an extra five minutes to go enjoy this beautiful weather oh um, yesterday, if you haven't heard, the city of Portland renewed all the restaurants parking space patio permits. So yay, that means that all the restaurants can cover them and heat them and use them for the winter. Now the permits are through March 31st. So that's great news for all the restaurants in town and uh, we're going to get planning for our patio and kind of look at different options and hopefully get it done in the next couple weeks or so. Um, and all the other restaurants are going to be doing the same. So we'll keep you posted, but for now it's nice weather so you can still enjoy the patio in the meantime. Um, all right guys, thank you so much for tuning in or for watching this after the fact. Um, hope you guys have a great week and uh, I'll see you next week for Shannon Blanc. All right, we'll try out our first uh, little half bottle for the first time. So you guys have to let me know how it goes. Okay, have a great day. See you soon.